Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast with Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. During this program, you will hear interviews with real-life successful investors who will share their stories and provide useful advice on how to acquire, finance, and operate apartment complexes. Now, here they are, Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Peebles, National Underwriter for Old Capital. And joining me today, smartest guy in the room, Mr. Michael Becker. Hey, Paul. Michael, how are you? Things are going good. What's new in the old capital world? Well, we have our conference coming up. That's our annual Old Capital Conference coming up October 25th, October 25th in Dallas. We're going to be releasing who our guest speaker is and the venue. I think you will be happy to... Make a reservation, so that will be announced here in the next couple of weeks. But I just want you to save it on your calendar, October 25th. If you're looking someplace to network, get to know a little bit more about what's going on in the multifamily world, October 25th in Dallas, Texas, we'll want to see you there. So we're looking forward to having you come. If you think that we do a good job of uh, telling you a little bit about how it is uh, in the multifamily industry, please go back into iTunes, give us a five-star rating. And maybe a comment or two. Tell us what you thought about the podcast and if there's anything that we need to improve on to help you. And, of course, your favorite guy, Mr. Michael Becker with Ask Mike Mondays. Is, is there a question that you have about multifamily? Michael's there to help you answer your question. So go into the Old Capital Podcast website. Leave a comment for Ask Mike Mondays. We'd love to, to have Michael answer the question. So in the podcast today, we have two of our friends that we've known for a long period of time. They're from a certain group that sells a lot of real estate in the whole United States, but they're based out of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Michael Ware and Will Jarnigan. Gentlemen, how are you today? Great. How are you guys? Doing we're, well. We're doing well. If you can remember back about uh, maybe a, two years ago or so, we had the guys on and they did a great job kind of explaining a little bit about what the multifamily industry looked like two years ago. And one of the things that that's kind of kept in my mind for people that were kind of new to multifamily, how to get into the marketplace, and the guys kind of made joint comments on this, but uh, if you're a new person without experience, without team, be prepared to overpay for the the asset in the marketplace. I think that was a great comment, absolutely true at that period of time. So we're going to kind of deep dive with these guys over at Bricadia and learn a little bit more about what's going on in today's market, what they're seeing, and how we could take advantage of working with uh, Will Jarnigan and Michael Ware. So I'm going to bring the Grand Inquisitor, Mr. Michael Becker, to the table. Mr. Michael Becker, let's get going. So Will, maybe we'll start with you. Maybe kind of give a little uh, brief background on yourself and maybe kind of fly the flag for Bricadia. Tell us a little bit about kind of the Dallas office or Bacchetti as a whole, and uh, maybe kind of what type of volume you guys did in 2018, I guess, our last year. Yeah, sure. So Bacchetti is a full-service commercial real estate firm with about 66 offices nationwide. We are a mortgage loan originator as well as an investment sales shop as well as a servicer the third largest loan servicer in the country. And specifically, I came to Bercadia in 2015 after a 12-year career at another uh, national brokerage firm and uh, specifically focused on investment sales in Dallas-Fort Worth, and along with my partners, Michael Ware, Taylor Hill, Jay Gunn, and Tom Burns. Last year uh, in 2018, we did, we executed on about $800 million worth of product, uh, closed six hundred and fifty. million put about another 150 or so under contract in the fourth quarter. So far in the first quarter, we've closed on about $200 million in product, and we are just blowing and going. That's cool. So. And Mike is the only one of the only other people that are a graduate from the University of North Texas that I know that are in the multifamily space. That's right, Screaming Eagles. Besides myself. So, uh, and then, uh, so Mike, maybe tell a little bit of uh, your background as well. So I, I kind of followed the same, same career path as Will. That's where we met each other. We were just young rookie brokers. I started off in the sales or intern program at a local shop. I spent 10 or 11 years over there before we went to Bricadia in 2015. And uh, same thing, I, I my entire professional career has been in the multifamily space. Completely dumb lucked into it, and I'm happy I did. That's good. That's good. And they happened to office a uh, caddy corner to me over here in North Dallas. So it's uh, nice and convenient for you guys coming in. 
So what I thought we could spend the uh, the most of the podcast here, just kind of talk real high level and then kind of maybe get a little bit more granular, but it's kind of general state of the market, what's going on today, where we're recording this, you know, in April 2019. So just trying to kind of see, you know, we're about a quarter into the year now, what's different today than, than you know, this time a year ago or the end of last year, et cetera. So maybe it's kind of, I'm going to kick you, Will, it's kind of the general state of the market. What's your perception of the market? Maybe maybe start kind of just with the capital that's out there. What's the capital type? Who's coming to Texas, et cetera? Because I, I read an article the other day that the census just came out that in 2018, at the ending of 2018, there was over 7.5 million people here in Dallas-Fort Worth area, and that's up about a million people from 2010. So yep. basically, um, you know, the entire MSA of – you know, I don't know, uh, Buffalo, New York, or Salt Lake City has been dropped on top of Dallas-Fort Worth yep. in the last eight years. That equivalent, so it's been a lot of growth. So what's the capital market like out? Who's in there? Who's the players, et cetera? Maybe talk about the different grades and who's looking for what. Sure. Yeah, so specifically, I focus on kind of the value-add space, and uh, Michael focuses on new construction and Class A stuff. So I'll speak specifically about value-add. The value-add market is as strong as it's ever been. There are more sources of capital, more new sources of capital, I think, than we've ever seen, uh, particularly in the space uh, under $25 million. And so, you know, it's as aggressive as it ever been for certain deals, the space north of 25 million, I'm starting to get a little bit thinner. The guys who can write an institutional size equity check, some of them anyways, have, have started looking in other markets, but still very strong by historical standards, still plenty of offers showing up on deals. And the only thing that I think that is of note in terms of a change in the market from last year in, in this space is is that in certain scenarios where a deal has been significantly value added, there is not as much interest as there used to be in those sort of deals right now. Um, we're still getting to pricing on them and there, there still is a market for them. It, it is just not as robust as it maybe was a year ago. So, so you're seeing the cutoff lines, 20, 25 million in capitalization. So if you're below that line, there's an abundant amount of capital and bidders once you kind of go north of that line. It tends to pull out a little bit. That's exactly right. And, and I would say that, as I mentioned, historically speaking, it's still very good. I, I think that what we did above $25 million is returned more to the mean on that thing as opposed to the kind of the hyper market that, that we have had um, in all product categories. And so I think that's what I'm seeing in that space. And, and then if I'm a horrible operator and I didn't spend any money in my, my – if I didn't put any money in my deal and starve my deal and operate it like crap, yeah. you're getting paid today, right, as a seller? <laughs> yeah, you're getting rewarded for that pretty yeah, much in yeah. this market. And then, Mike, what uh, – as we go up the property grade and up the food chain. What are you seeing there? So I would say that it's still pretty robust. In the Class A space, obviously everyone knows the issue here in Dallas is oversupply. So we're hitting peak supply this year uh, with roughly 28,000 units that are supposed to be delivered. And then next year, we have another 30,000 that's going to hit the market. After that, what we've seen is the permits for this year have dropped to the 10-year historical average of 17,000 units, which is good. It's healthy for the market. And uh, that's an issue, obviously, in, in certain areas like uh, Uptown and, and Legacy West and City Line and parts of Las Colinas or like Infill Fort Worth. But there's still been really good suburban rent growth in the Class A space. And, you know, the, um, you alluded to it earlier, I think with the million, million jobs, a stat, I travel around the country and share this presentation. And I think my favorite thing is if you look at a moderate growth scenario for Dallas, we have 2.9 million jobs coming here from 2010 to 2030. And that, you said Buffalo, New York earlier, 2.9 million is the Denver MSA that's going to get dropped on Dallas in a 20-year yeah. time period, right? So the long-term outlook and the macro is we're going to be undersupplied through 2030 in Dallas. So to me, it's a short-term kind of shot in the nose as far as concessions and maybe like a little bit of flattening rent growth in some of the Class A submarkets. But on the long term, it's going to be really healthy. Developers have headwinds with hard cost and, and labor, finding and retaining skilled labor. So the number of deliveries is going back down in 2021, and I think we're going to see a good rent run. Yeah, that's one of the things I just kind of want to maybe drive home because I've raised capital. That's the stat I, yeah. uh, I quote as well is that, uh, you know, there's two and a half to three million more people yeah. going to be in Dallas-Fort Worth on top of a seven and a half, maybe 7.6 million person base today. So, you know, we're going to grow by a third 15 years or something like that. And, yep. and that's, you know, like Charlotte, that's Orlando, that's Denver on top of that's, Dallas Fort Worth. So, so if you, if you have another 2 million people from now to 2030 is Las Vegas. So flop the Las Vegas MSA and DFW. Yeah. It's, un, it's, un, it's staggering. 
Yeah. It's staggering. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. I think I think that's that's a good point. Not to be the chamber of commerce cheerleader here, but uh, to see <laughs> all these people moving here, we feel it in the daily life. I'm just driving around, living here in the market. All four of us live in this market, and you just kind of feel it. All have been here for a very, very long time. So you kind of just feel that day to day with the traffic, the people and et cetera. So while there might be some temporary disruption, it seems like the, uh, you know, long term growth is, is good. And if you're in the workforce space, it seems like, you know, as, as, as Mike alluded to, the, uh, the hard cost of labor, the, the, you know, permitting, the impact fees, everything is going up. What does it cost to deliver like your suburban unit and so like a suburban Plano? yeah suburban garden like open park deal was one sixty a door roughly hard, hard cost hard, yeah all in all in one sixty and so we've had to guys sell it for developer profit you got to sell for what, 180, 190 to make money yeah and and there's some guys that are going really deep on amenities and interior finish outs and the costs are running up to like one ninety a door and that's suburban and then if you're yeah. you know uptown Dallas you got to oh, build a, a five yeah. five Depen- yeah, depending on what you're, you know, what, what the dirt is, which is running away from everybody right now. You know, anecdotally, we've had developers come tell us, like, hey, we want to be value add guys. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we're like, why? And that just tells us it's getting harder for those guys to pencil deals right now. Yeah. You know, the, the bonus, though, is that's the same issue on the single family side. So, you know, we've heard builders saying, hey, look, I need to build a home at a base of $300,000 for me to make money. It's not worth my time, effort, and energy unless I build this for a floor of three hundred. And first time home buyers by the by the numbers are saying, Hey, I need the cost to be at two fifty or lower, or I can't afford it. It doesn't make sense for me. So that gap is preventing a lot of your your would be first time home buyers from leaving the apartment market and staying in rental units. Which yeah. depending on how you look at it, you know, if you're an apartment guy, it's really good for you. Yeah. And but, so I, I know one day a few months ago, Will and I were having a beer at in with Tavern and he uh, he mentioned a local watering hole. I mean, he was mentioning uh, he had a thought of a year or so ago, I guess it was, and, and you told me that your prediction is that we're going to keep going until at least the average B-class deal. So like your your suburban B-class deal built in mid-80s, like your Bedford, your Hearst, your your Garland, hits $120,000 a unit. Yep. And that was probably ten thousand dollar ten ten thousand a unit ago. Yep. Where do you think we are, and how did you kind of come up to that? I thought it was pretty insightful. How did you come up to that number? Yeah. So it's a little bit more art than science, uh, <laughs> I would say. No. Uh, just I was looking at where rents were heading, and you know the delta between Class A rents and Class B rents at that point in time, <laughs> and just in general where. Where the marketplace was heading, you know, the cost of capital, all of those things kind of kind of went into it. And also somewhat looking at other markets out there. And, you know, I mean Phoenix and Chicago are good examples of you know, markets Denver. where the Denver where similar housing is much more expensive than than it is here. And I think that we have a better story for the marketplace in, in general, certainly than Chicago. Phoenix and Denver are both pretty compelling, but you know DFW I think it edges them both out. And so I think that you know some of the supply issues that we had in the late '80s, early '90s took a long time to work themselves out of this marketplace. I mean, we just reached um, you know a 94 percent occupancy or better back in in 2015. Uh, it was the first time in the history of the marketplace. And so I think that now that we are in an equilibrium, even though we're delivering a, a lot of units, uh, historically speaking, I mean, when you look at the amount of units that we're adding on top of existing stock, it's going to be really difficult, I think, given the environment that we're in for us to outkick our coverage that, that far again um, at any point in the future. And so I just think our prices will stabilize around that number. Our rents will get to that number. You know, we've already seen B-class rents in Dallas-Fort Worth in excess of a thousand bucks a unit, which is, you know, would have been unheard of five years ago. So I think we'll keep, and the other thing is we're not making any new workforce housing here. So, or very little for that matter. So, and, and so, so to kind of put that perspective, you guys started the business in 04, 05? Yeah, no. Oh, oh, five. Oh, oh, 05. And yeah. then and rents for your average B class deal in 05 <laughs> or what? And they're, they said they're about 1,000 or so yeah. kind of across the board today. Probably 650, maybe 700 uh, if I had to go back and what. That'd actually yeah. be interesting. That, to, that, that, that would be like on the best deals. Yeah. 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 I mean, but you could, you could get a one bed for five to 600 yeah. bucks yeah. in Carrollton yeah, all day. Oh, yeah. or Bedford. Yeah. yeah. All day. Yeah. Addison. I, think, I did. 550 bucks a month. Yeah. I at think the Brooks. It's now first, torn down. First place that I rented out of college coming back here. Um, 
was somewhere in that 550 600 buck average so, so so we basically doubled rents in, in yeah. your career yeah mm-hmm. so yeah. well what's interesting too is if you look on the on a national average we're approximately twenty six thousand dollars per door below the national average we're the fourth largest msa in the u.s and depending on chicago's bleed rate and our and our our growth and you know, we'll be the third largest msa in call it 15 years as yeah. a guess you know plus or minus three or four years yeah and uh, I just don't see, I mean, 100,000 jobs a year takes care of a lot of issues, right, and drives a lot of rental prices up. So, you know, I think it's a matter of time before we just on par with the national average. And, and I would make Will right, unfortunately. <laughs> He'll never let me hear the end of it. So, <laughs> so not not to go down memory lane too much here, but, um, you know, I think it's important for people, a lot of people that, that Old Capital makes loans to or the first-timers or, or relatively young in the in the business and to get the perspective, like, the first several deals you guys sold and the buyer pool, how is that different today? Like the profile of your buyer on the last couple of workforce, specifically, well, the last couple of workforce deals you guys have great, sold. Great question. Yeah, compared to, say, 2006, where you just signed in contracts on back because of pickup trucks versus uh, <laughs> boardrooms now. Like, what's kind of the difference? Every buyer in 2006 was a California 1031 buyer. Today, I would say that um, you might have – one or two out of every 10 transactions that ends up being a California 1031 buyer that exchanged out of a, you know, six unit or eight unit complex into a larger one in DFW. There's been a lot of liquidity created in this marketplace from out of state investors who are not necessarily 1031 buyers, but who are people who, you know, are raising money through friends and family networks. And then also a lot of, you know, local organic real estate investor growth. I think, you know, people who also raise money from friends and family. And so the the buyer pool and the level of sophistication in today's market is entirely different than it was in 2006. Paul, you were around doing deals back then. What any, any thoughts on that? Uh, no, he, Will's exactly right. Even before that period of time, it was a lot of California investors that were coming in. And the theme was from California, uh, it wasn't go west, young man. It was go east and go <laughs> and go east to uh, to Texas specifically because of the, it was the land of opportunity. In fact, uh, in 1992, it was that phrase was given to me by one of the banks I worked for was not go west out of California, but go east and jump into to Texas. What is going on these days in terms of valuated properties? I mean, Will, you, you do a lot of valuated properties. Tell us a little bit about what people are doing to these valuated properties to get the biggest bang for their buck. What type of amenity packages are you seeing in some of these properties that are bringing a lot of opportunities for people to look at? Sure. Well, the biggest uh, opportunity in the marketplace today is the property that hasn't been touched, has been owned by the same owner for 20 years, and they haven't done a single thing. Um, Of course, those are increasingly rare to come by. But in terms of what people are doing, everyone has gotten so creative with common area amenities that you you have to focus on your common areas in order to stand out from the competition in most cases. And so things like the addition of dog parks, package rooms, club rooms, game areas, anything that you can do and get creative on that, I think, is is very beneficial because um, tenants are starting to get used to, in the value-add space, looking for common area amenities, whereas almost no properties had them maybe 10 years or, or so ago. On the interiors, we're seeing a lot of focus on not only upgrading the appliances and flooring, but also adding you know some more nicer finish out that would be comparable to newer properties backsplashes, lighting packages, even technology packages such as Nest thermostats and and stuff like that. And then I would say that one of the biggest focuses in the the marketplace right now is figuring out a way to either provide washers and dryers and units with connections or to be able to add connections um, into some of these older properties and retrofit them, get rid of some of the functional obsolescence that that the properties have. And so that is a big one. Tenants are starting to look for properties that that have those. Um, As most tenants in the value add space will rent washer dryers rather than own their own. So, you know, that kind of very generally speaking is, is what we're seeing. What gets your attention these days for a person that is interested in buying a property that may not have multifamily experience, may not have purchased the property? You may not know that person. 
how do they get to the table? How do they get a seat at the table to actually get an opportunity to try to buy that property? Well, I think very first, you know, the way that they act during the marketing process gives us a very good indication that they're serious initially. So um, what I mean by that is they don't just send an email asking for, hey, what's the whisper price on this? They they want to come schedule and tour it. By the time they come and tour it, they've already read the OM. They know about the property. They've They've looked at the financials. Then as we go through the process, them being very proactive about letting us know who their lender will be on the transaction, who their construction people will be, all those types of things. And then when we finally get to the offer process and, and you know, we're talking Turkey, obviously, you know, they're going to have to have a very strong offer if they, if they don't have a track record. They're going to have to be very strong. They're going to have to show a high a level of seriousness. And by that, I mean, you know, tight time frames, hard, earnest money deposits. Is this market really still at, you need to put a hundred, 200, 300, $400,000 hard money day one into the deal? Yes. I'd say every winner in our deals put up hard earnest money. Yeah. Right. Especially, especially in you guys. And going back to what he said about like the debt team, like we obviously, I mean, we do origination in our shop, but we've known Old Capital for a long time, right? So if you're a, the new group in town with no resume, you need to have some kind of reference. And so we call you guys and say, hey, do you know Johnny Buyer or Sally Buyer? And you say, yeah, they're, they're legit. They've got money. Here's what their program is going to look like. We've already run the traps for them. That makes us feel so much better. And we can go to our client who we actually represent and say, hey, listen, if we pick this horse, like it, we're not going to we're not going to fall on our face here. They've been vetted. We run our traps. We know the lender group. They've given them the green light. You know, this is a safe pick, mm-hmm. and they have the best price. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of the combination of all of it. But but the best price doesn't doesn't always win the game, but it wins ninety percent of the game. Yes, so, if they're credible. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I mean there are certain situations where the seller themselves wants to take a more credible option and. That, unfortunately, is always going to be the case in, in any market. But generally speaking, best price, best terms wins the deal. And if you don't have a track record, sometimes you unfortunately end up being on the uh, end of you may have had the best price in terms, but someone with a better track record gets Mike, the deal. Uh, you're putting a lot of hard money into these deals. Is that uh, Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> <laughs> is that helping you? Yeah, I mean that's that's it. especially when you're doing a deal that's either off market or lightly marketed. You know that's just what it takes. And I mean we we just got a deal in escrow that was a weird seller, and you just you know you just had to he he didn't want us to step foot on the property, so you know we basically you know of course we went on the property, but you know we didn't we shopped it and you know drove it and had had our you know inspection guy go just drive it and walk it and. We think we have a pretty good idea what's going on the property, and we'll know uh, how close we were during diligence, and we go live 150 day one. But that's our 35th, 36th deal. You don't do yeah. that on your first deal. Sure. You kind of graduate up to it. You know what it. you're looking at already. Yeah, and, and then that's the the experience kind of uh, mm-hmm. mitigates a lot of that type of risk because I just, you know, been burned on this or that throughout the years, and you just kind of – you figure it out. And that, that's it. But, yeah, if you want to you be a player, you want to buy the better deals – for sure, if you if you're bidding on you know something that that maybe no one else wants, and maybe that's not the case. And how about but you will? I mean, uh, there are some sellers out there that want to take that flyer to get the highest price, and they are they are convinced this is the right buyer. And you're like, you kind of shake your head. This is not the right buyer. Yeah. And I know this deal is going to get retraded. I know this guy's either going to depart from his original terms. He's yeah. going to do it. How many times does that come across? Well, I mean, you know, uh, just for the record, our sellers have never done anything wrong or ma- made a uh, bad decision. But in those instances, if one were to happen, yes, sometimes a client will take a flyer. I've heard of this happening. It's never happened to me personally. But a, a client will uh, take a flyer on a, an unimproven buyer, and there will be – you know, usually um, if there's not hard money in that scenario and you're going out for the higher price, usually it always ends up working its way back down from, from the original price offered. But Have you ever met a buyer that said he's retraded? No, that, that's the other thing. In 15 we, years? We, no buyer's ever retraded <laughs> um, when, it, when, when the call for offers comes. But, you know, I think that this is a marketplace where there's enough interest in deals that, you, you know, you very rarely have a, 
a situation where you end up with no hard money on the table after you go through the call for offers and best and final process. And most of the time, it's a matter of picking you know, what you think is the best of, of three or four really good options. Are you, so. are you calling to verify references from some of these buyers? Yeah, all the time, especially if we don't know them. And so if there's someone who's bought out of our market but not in our market before, then we'll call you know those references. If it's someone that hasn't transacted before but they have a network of people who have or – you know, a lender who can, you know, vouch for them, then we will definitely call those people. So what's not to be too Dow specific. So maybe we can kind of apply these principles across the, the nation because I'm sure it's probably similar, but are there any locations that are, that are, you know, we've been on such a hell of a run for nine years now. Are there any like locations or specific properties that are uh, characteristics that are, are starting to kind of back up a little bit and getting some pushback? I know you mentioned Obviously, if the less value add you have, the less interest, and in and in, as we sit right now, which I'm sure will change in a year or whenever, but yep. you get that equity check over about eight million bucks. It seems like that's when we're, we're kind of seeing the buyer pool shrink a little bit, and that's just what's going on today. Yep. But short of those two things, are there any like sub markets or characteristics of uh, that that are kind of getting a little soft? So there are a couple out there, and you know, I mean, in particular. You know, North Arlington is one that right now we've seen a little bit of softness in. And um, some of it, I think, has to do with the fact that there's been some new supply come online not too far away from there. And, um, you know, we've talked to a number of property owners in the area that are having a, a tough time with qualification. It seems like that the traffic that comes through their door is not qualified. This is the workforce. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, this is in workforce. And so and at the same time, we've it, seen some. What does that mean, Michael? Because a lot of people don't understand what workforce no. housing means. Yeah, yeah. Well, kind of maybe we can describe it, but you know, just your thousand dollar kind of renter in Dallas Fort Worth or it's kind of your median, median area income. You know, you, you're kind of at maybe, uh, you know, one third of that in rent, something yeah. like that. Yep. Yeah, I, w- I would say that, you know, generally speaking, it would it would be, you know, everyone that wouldn't be a class A renter. And so, you know, you have, I think, you know, what you're seeing is in some areas where the pain is pretty evident to some of the development projects in the area, you're seeing that them loosen their standards, which is allowing people from workforce housing to maybe move into a little bit nicer of a product. And so, you know, it's causing some softness, but by and large, the marketplace, except for those couple of sub markets, I think by and large, the marketplace is still pretty strong. What about markets that historically have been high crime that have had a hell of a run yeah. for the last five years in particular? <laughs> Lake uh, Islands. Lake I mean, Islands yeah. or, or yeah. Woodhaven are the two yeah. that yeah. jump yeah. out to me. It's been a hell yeah. of a run, right? For both of those sub markets, you know, like you said, five years ago, People wouldn't touch those deals, and then uh, I think uh, they're pretty select group of operators that were backed by you know pretty sophisticated capital went in and said, "Hey, this is a great location. There's great demographics surrounding the area. Like, why are we not improving this place?" And they've, they've yeah. killed done it. By, and they've killed it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Killed are, it. are you seeing like Lake Highlands or Woodhaven back up at all in demand from like no. investor demand? Actually, I had mean, a long conversation this morning with a. Uh, a pretty significant owner owner over there and they're he's like we're doing really well i think they're going to exit one deal and everything else they're just going to hold long term or, or recap and go long he's like we love it you know and the tenure outlook over there is outstanding you know? and we've seen prices uh basically quadruple in that yeah. sub market over the last five or six years and so i would say that the people who were Scared of the, those sub markets beforehand, probably still are. Yeah, that'd be um, me. <laughs> <laughs> and those who are not, I mean, to be honest with you, what we've seen, and we did a deal recently with a group that you know moved out of an even tougher sub market into that sub market, and yeah. that was, um, you know, believe it or not, kind step of a, a step up. And so, you know, I think you always see capital kind of move like that. And so it's it's certainly been interesting, but you know, by and large, that that particular sub market has has been one of the bright spots um, in terms of rent growth and occupancies yeah. in Lake Highlands in particular is what I'm speaking of. Been one of the bright spots in the entire market in terms of occupancy and rent growth. It's really, they have really performed very well over the last couple of years. People are raising money these days and they continue to raise money to buy these properties. Where do you see, you know, cap rates these days? I mean, a class A, Michael. Yep. Class B and C, well, where are the cap rates right now? And I guess kind of divided between 
value add potential and kind of non value add. I've got a really weird answer for you on this one. So class A, B, and C properties, cap rates are about four and a half to five cap, all of them. Isn't that weird? <laughs> Uh, we we kind of well, jokingly Michael says the same yeah. thing. No, I mean the the cap rates are pretty much converged on each other. Oddly yeah. enough, right? And one of you guys mentioned like you get rewarded for being a sloppy operator and not fixing your deal. So it's like the more hair that's on a middle market deal we take out, the lower the cap because we can sell the the dream, right? Hey, this, there's meat in the bone here. You can operate better than the previous person. Go for it, right? And then on the on the class A stuff, I mean, we're literally pricing. Oddly enough, almost the same caps. Like it's a four and a half to a five, depending on the location and the type of deal it is. So the question becomes, do I just go buy a coupon on a class A deal and have to put no work, you know, no capital into it? I don't have to mess with any of the hair that's, you know, typically associated with a heavy value add. Or do I go buy a a heavy lift deal and and take the risk and and capture a lot more of the upside? And and then so like the difference between a value add and a a stabilized and like workforce, a C or B, you know, someone that's renovated 80% of the units on a a B deal is probably 100 bips. Yeah. So I think to us, that's we're figuring that out in process right now. And to me, that's the next wave of deals for DFW because we've gone through nine years of, of deals that have been churned through two or three times, right? So now you're on your third or fourth iteration of a value add deal. And it's like, how much more juice can you really squeeze? And the buyers are looking at this saying, okay, look, 70% of the units have been done or 80% of the units have been done. What is the penalty associated with that for real? Like what kind of deal level return do we need on a three to five year hold? And, and I think that's something we haven't seen a whole lot of in our market yet. But I think again, the next two or three years, like that's going to be the majority of the deals that trade and it's it's how do you price it? I mean, shit. You buy a, a C deal in Irving, and you're going to pay a four and a half cap because yeah. it's got you know needs ten thousand a door or whatever to move. Yield to your costs from a four and a half. And you're hoping to get to six and a half or seven to your cost. Yes. Mm-hmm. Or you could buy a deal that's turnkey at a, probably a six. Yep. And maybe some concessions, right? So the story yeah. becomes: Is it easier to sell my my board or my investors or my equity partners the Hey, I'm gonna go spend you know five to seven thousand a unit and get the two hundred dollar pop plus organic rent growth, or do we go in at the same cap basis on a brand new deal, you know, underwrite around the concession story for the next eighteen to twenty four months, and now you've got a brand new deal, yeah. you know, and then a market which is going to be undersupplied again in a couple of years. Yeah. So that's that's kind of the, the the two avenues we're hearing yeah. investors kind of make the decision on. It's like, what do we do? Like, which yeah. path do we go down? Yeah. I also think it's important to point out that cap rates are subjective. Um, you know, on, on, so. <laughs> on every deal that you, on every deal that you talk about, the buyer's cap rates different than the seller's cap rates different than the lender's cap rate. But generally speaking, I, I agree with with you guys. I mean, it is uh, there is a a penalty in this market for a deal that is quote unquote too nice in the value add space that's been renovated too much. And even if you can, you know, clearly demonstrate the upside that is, that remains there, it's tough to get the equity excited so, about it. So that, that, that makes sense. I'm just going on a tangent here, but that makes sense that you're going to go buy a 70 piece of crap deal, spend a bunch of money and then underwrite a cap rate that, you know, like today you'd be penalized. You're probably underwriting too aggressive of an exit assumption because yep. if you go implement your business plan, you're, you're taking away the buyer pool on the exit yep. to yep. a certain extent. So what is that right discount? I don't know, but it's two, three, four, five years out in the future. So who really knows? But yeah. it's just kind of interesting yeah. how the market's been reacting and shifting and yeah. I'll be curious to see what the future holds. Yeah, it's exactly right. And it's all kind of happening before our eyes right here, right now, because you know, we haven't gotten to a point in the market to this point where, you know, as Michael was saying, all of the deals that have been out there for the last five or six years have had a lot of runway left in them in terms of uh, work left to be done. Now you're starting to see some of the deals show up that really don't have that much. And so, you know, not a lot of those have traded o- over the last several years. It's It's been the, the ones that still have 90% left or 70% left. And so, you know, we'll have to come back again here in a couple of years and tell you how all this uh, this yeah. went. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> so, explain to me exactly what you guys do, because a lot of people don't understand what a broker listing broker does on a multifamily side. Some some people can understand the the selling side if they've been in a single family business. They can understand the listing side if they've been in the single family business, but maybe they don't understand that typically they don't have representation typically the ownership the buyer that typically doesn't have ownership that you guys represent 
the seller of the property, and that your value-added piece to the deal is not only are you able to show and share with them an opportunity, but you know everybody in town. And a lot of people always want to try to try to find those off-market deals, and they try to call all the sellers and try to be you know try to deal directly with the seller. Tell me a little bit more about your value-added piece of the deal. Sure. So what I would say is is that not only you know do we market deals for sale, and of course we we know you know most if not all of the prominent players in town, and I would say that you know our biggest value add pitch, if you will, when we go into a you know pitch for a, for a potential listing is is that we know the market and we are able to tell the story on the ground of the sub market. And in order for the available pool of buyers to see what the value add story is um, in the deal. And so, you know, where it may be different from other aspects of real estate, we study the marketplace very thoroughly. And when, when we go out to market a deal, we have done, you know, countless hours of research down to the very, you know, submarket property level. And, you know, a lot of it is because we know the players that own the deal next door and in, in that submarket. But, you know, I think we can deliver that story to the marketplace better than, than anyone in our, in my opinion. And so that's, that's really, I think, where we separate ourselves. Yeah. To supplement to that, it goes back. So we're talking to everybody, right? So mm-hmm. we're the advisors on the, on the brokerage desk. So we get to see everything. We're, you know, we don't compete in the marketplace. We don't GP deals. So we find the good deals that we think, and then we're not going out and trying to raise money and buy them, right? right. We, we're going out to the people we're talking to. That's crucial as well because the feedback we get, and we spend a lot of time locally and traveling around the country and just saying, hey, what are you seeing? You know, because because the operators and the managers are in the trenches every day. Like they get the rent rolls every day or the reports every month. So we kind of take that feedback and try to convey that to the rest of the marketplace. Because I think you have to manage the gap, right? You're you're managing the bid ask spread and making sure that both buyers and sellers are kind of in alignment on where the market's headed. Mm -hmm. There's always about a six month lag between like a true correction and a materialization into the pricing, right? So a lot of our job is to manage that. And then I think it's really kind of to what Will said, like we get the story. And, and the older I get and the more I've done this, you realize like buyers want to buy deals, right? Mm-hmm. People want to transact. So our job is to help them, whether it's just their private equity partner or their board of directors say, hey, listen, here's the story. Here's how you articulate this. And here's the demographics. Here's the comps. And here's why this deal is worth X today and will be worth Y in three or five years, whatever your strategy is. Mm-hmm. And you just try to help them with the the concrete facts for, you know, for instance, 2 million people in the next 11 years. I mean, there's a lot of people with New York equity or California, they don't know that stuff, right? And you lay it out for them and make it easy to say, hey, listen, like this deal is going to work and here's why. And I think that when you help people understand that or realize that or make it easy for them to go pitch the deal to their people, it, it helps them push pricing. And that's what we do. So the last five transactions that you you guys have done – what is the seller of the apartment buying? Are they buying more apartments? Are they buying triple nets, getting out of the business? What are they What are they doing with their money? I think that one transaction that we've done was a 1031 exchange out of the last five, where the buyer is ex- exchanging into multiple properties out of one. He bought the property in, in 2012 at a in very distressed and Made a very large, substantial amount of money on it. It's been able to exchange into two different properties. The other four, the the sellers paid the capital gains, and moved Ooh. on. So I think that there's a lot of were well, those guys like syndicators or were they like individuals? Uh, both. <laughs> and so I think that there's a high desire at this point in the marketplace to put cash aside. And so you know, as opposed to going out and 1031ing and rebuying, you know, at a higher basis than what you're selling at at this point. Uh, six months down the line, there's there's a significant demand out there for people to put money aside and and you know kind of take some chips off the table. Sounds like it's all over the map, huh? Indeed. Well, cool. Well, I, uh, I I definitely appreciate you guys coming in all the way across the street. So that's uh, that was, that was another long journey. <laughs> tough here. walk. Thanks, Thanks for having walk. us. And uh, if you guys ever want to find us, you can go to them. Then with Tavern at Happy Hour. That's, uh, that's where deals get done, right? Usually, yeah. where deals get I, done. I'm, I've never heard of it. <laughs> if, if people, yeah. If people no. Want- no. In all seriousness, before we wrap up, I mean that that's one of the things I always pound the table is uh, people do business with people they know, like and trust. And if you don't get out and meet people in person and 
they don't get to know, like, or trust you, then you're not going to do deals. And that's just kind of how it is. So that can either be at a conference or over a light beer at a, at a dive bar, you know, it could be, it could be anything. <laughs> if people wanted to get to know you a little bit better, what's the best email address to get a hold of you, Will? Will.jarnigan, J-A-R-N-A-G-I-N at Bercadia, B-E-R-K-A-D-I-A.com. Michael? I'm Michael.ware at Bercadia.com. And it's W-A-R-E. W-A-R-E. That's at, correct. At Bricadia.com. So Will Jarnigan, Michael Ware, uh, and Michael Becker, thanks for coming in. We appreciate your time. And uh, let's uh, sell some deals and buy some deals. Thanks, thanks for having thanks us. Thanks for having us, guys. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at oldcapitalpodcast.com to sign up for our weekly email updates. We'll see you next week for another great interview.